My name is Irene Dupont, Jr. I-R-E-N-E-E -E -E space D-U space capital P-O-N-T comma J, capital J-R. Uh, I was born January 8th, 1920, and I haven't died yet. Well, that's something we're all very grateful for. It's wonderful to be here today. I'm Cindy Kelly. It is August 11, 2014, and we are in the gracious home of of Irene Dupont Jr. and uh, we're here to learn a little bit more about his life and uh, the company who shares his name. So maybe you can start with your life. <laughs> well, uh, my life hasn't been much. I, I've been uh, dilatory in my duties ever since birth, I'm sure. But uh, it's certainly been a pleasant time on the planet, and Barbie and I are still enjoying it. We've been married over 70 years, and we have uh, uh, had five productive grandchildren, and five productive children, uh, 13 grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. So it's been a, a great experience. So where were you, you say you, you were talking earlier that you grew up in Philadelphia. Where was your family, where were you? Uh... Um, well, my, my father's family, my father grew up in Philadelphia. My grandfather, Lamont DuPont, his, his, my father's father, he had a uh, few disappointments with the DuPont company, which was run by a president and nobody else knew what was going on either financially or who the customers were or anything. The president did everything. Lamott was an uh, engineer and a, uh, a, a chemist and uh, he didn't seem to be going anywhere. He read in the paper that a, uh, a, uh, some Swede had invented uh, a way of making nitroglycerin manageable and so he got a, applied and received a license under the Nobel system for making dynamite. He went, he left the DuPont company and moved the family to Philadelphia and built a dynamite plant across the Delaware River from Philadelphia and uh, in that, that uh, he had an unfortunate experiment where he lost his life when a charge of nitroglycerin got out of control, an experimental charge, and detonated. So uh, that left <clears throat> his family, his, his uh, wife and ten children with another one in utero. Uh, there were, uh, with nothing much to do, but fortunately Lamont left an estate which kept them, made them possible for them to get educated and live rather comfortably. So uh, <coughs> uh, years later, of course, the DuPont Company bought the Eastern Dynamite Company and uh, made it part of theirs, but that was a uh, after the tyrant president had uh, moved on. So uh, my father uh, had an older brother who seemed to know how the world worked and he had a quick mind and a good heart and the older brother saw that his four younger brothers all were admitted to MIT to get educated, and the uh, two of the four younger brothers stayed in college long enough to get degrees. And my father came out uh, with a master's degree, and uh, uh, that was the Depression of 1898, and so he uh, uh, 
had trouble getting a job, but uh, his older brother's college roommate at MIT had a, manufact a manufacturer's contracting company in Newark, New Jersey, and hired my father. My father, with a job, was able to marry his second cousin, Irene DuPont, and uh, they uh, produced uh, eight daughters. And uh, then I came along and ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so that's my background. Uh, so your dad uh, was working for this company in Newark, New Jersey. Yeah. And uh, and then and then what happened? Oh well, his older brother did some and executed the mother of all. Uh, leveraged buyouts, and he and uh, Pierre DuPont, this is my father's older brother, born in 1870 and died in 1954, he uh, got the DuPont company off on a new, new tack uh, with the leveraged buyout, and uh, so he bought bought the uh, manufacturer's contracting company and made it the engineering department of the DuPont Company. And my father moved to Wilmington with that acquisition, with early acquisition of, the, of, uh, of a, an engineering group. And uh, so then the children started uh, appearing uh, two were born in New Jersey, and the next uh, six daughters uh, were born at 17th and the Rising Sun Lane in, in Delaware, Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, they were very pleasant older sisters. I came along uh, still at 17th and Rising Sun Lane, but in 1923, my uh, father and mother moved all of them out to the country in a house that uh, you're interviewing right today. Now, what? That's wonderful. So how many, how many bedrooms? Was there one for all uh, nine of you and well, your parents? Well, in the old days, uh, people didn't have that many bedrooms, and my sister's were eight, so they they had uh, always lived in four bedrooms, and they proceeded to do that. This house does have uh, not eleven bedrooms of sorts. The one in the garret in the attic is uh, well, the shower is an afterthought, and it's it's a pretty humble room, and it gets very hot in summer. Uh, but the uh, 10 other bedrooms are scattered around the house, and uh, five of them were occupied by uh, the eight daughters, and I had a, one to myself. Uh, it's a small room, I remember, and uh, I shared a bathroom with the housekeeper and my uh, it overlooks the, the my little bedroom overlooked the front courtyard, and I can remember when things were noisy downstairs. It meant there were a lot of grown-ups talking and uh, having, uh, I guess, adult beverages in the days of prohibition, and. Uh, uh, then after a while, things would get quieter, and you'd see the headlights of cars would make patterns on the ceiling of my bedroom. The light came through the window, and these rectangles and tri triangles and shapes would form on the ceiling, and I knew then that the party was over and they were all going home. Oh, that's great. So, do you think that that was something that was a frequent occurrence? 
Did you have? Did your parents have a lot of entertaining? Did they do a lot of entertaining? Well, my parents did a lot of entertaining. Well, my certainly while my father was president of the company, he was obliged to bring home every visiting potentate that came from England or France or wherever to see how to make various uh, new products that the pot company was making. So uh, we had uh, Sunday luncheons where the married daughters would come back with their husbands and, uh, and at whatever friends that my father had to bring home for the weekend would be there to, to witness the procedure of an American dinner on Sunday. They were uh, elegant. We had a butler and a serving maid, and they, the tablecloth was spread, a white one with a pad underneath it to make it kind of soft so you would spill a wine glass very easily. And uh, uh, the conversation was all adult stuff that I didn't understand. So were you... Um did you go to school nearby? Were you, or did you go away to school? Well, my, uh, my education started. The lady that <clears throat> really ran the house had been my mother's uh, boarding school roommate and had been a teacher. And she came uh, after she closed her school with her, that she and her sister had made. Uh, she came and lived with us to take care of things. Uh, she came about the time that my father was promoted to the presidency and they, they knew he was going to do a lot of traveling. So Aunt Reby, we called her, Aunt Reby ran the house and I shared a bathroom with her. And so I got to know her. <laughs> and uh, so when I got to be six years old, uh, she said, I think you know, that boy ought to get taught, start school. And so my mother said, well, why don't you start teaching him and then we'll figure out where to go from there. So I got the equivalent of first grade from Aunt Reby. And she was good because when I started out at Tower Hill School in second grade, I was the head of the class for quite a few months be before they caught up. <laughs> But she insisted on cursive writing and uh, spelling and arithmetic and, and learning how to read. And so I was a good reader in those days, but I never learned any more. So I'm a very slow reader now because that's the way my brain works. But uh, after Tower Hill, I graduated uh, at age 18 and got a, uh, uh, enrolled at Dartmouth because at Tower Hill there had been quite a number of very successful uh, and movements from Tower Hill to Dartmouth and they uh, had an arrangement where Dartmouth would, take, Dartmouth would take any Tower Hill graduate that was recommended by the headmaster and he had uh, he recommended four from our graduating class. And I was one of them. And I went to Dartmouth and it was very interesting because I'd never been away from home. And, uh, but they were pleasant. And uh, uh, well, I needn't go too far with how my classmates did, but my, uh, my roommate, Glenn Brown, uh, he got there to Dartmouth with me, and, and he, he majored in adult beverages. And uh, I noticed he wasn't going to class much. I think he, by January, he got a grade point average of 0 0.6. And, uh, uh, and they didn't ask him back in June. And he went to the army. Didn't see didn't see Glenn much for a long time, but he did marry. 
Well, the next time I met him was about the third or fourth move the DuPont Company had moved me to, Barbie and me, to uh, Charleston, West Virginia, and Glenn Brown was my boss. <laughs> he had, <laughs> he had uh, married and she took him by the ear and got him into the Virginia Polytechnic Institute. He was on the dean's list the whole way through. And so he was ahead of me by the time we got, met together at Dartmouth at the, the Bell Works for the DuPont Company. He was a great guy, nice boss and thoughtful and firm. So what was your major at Dartmouth? Well, I was thought I only lasted two years and uh, uh, thought I was going to major in chemistry. But uh, by the second year in chemistry, it, it, it didn't have much uh, that I could really figure out. Uh, it was it's more like Latin. You just learn a whole lot of truths, you know, and you have to apply them. Uh, you couldn't <laughs> look at it and see how it was going to happen. <laughs> Where I had I made the mistake of buying a used Cadillac. Uh, I bought a 1918 Cadillac as a freshman, which were, freshmen weren't allowed to do. And I didn't have to do much fixing up, I, but it, and it ran very well. And I uh, was working on it one day, my sophomore year, and I suddenly realized, you know, I like doing this. I, this is much more fun than what I do up in my room with all that homework stuff. And my roommate was having the same feelings about his uh, he, uh, his uh, majoring in chemistry, and he said, "I'm going to quit the chemistry and be a doctor. Why don't you go ahead and just go to a school where they have mechanical engineering? Well, where is that? Well, MIT does. And, oh, I couldn't go there." <laughs> Well, try it. And he said, uh, uh, I sent in an application and I got back a catalog and little correspondence went. And uh, next thing I knew, I was admitted as a, I had to repeat my sophomore year. But that wasn't bad considering it was, and when I got to MIT, my marks went up significantly. And uh, uh, it was fun because uh, everything they had, everything you had in class was interesting, and they could understand it. So I got a, a, out of a class of 1943. We graduated during the war, and we had to go all summers to keep up because of the war effort. And so I only lost half a year by the move, and. Uh, graduated and was hired by Ranger Aircraft Engines of Farmingdale, Long Island, and had three great years uh, fighting the Battle of Farmingdale, which was, as a civilian, uh, was interesting. After the war, I left because they really didn't have much to do They're making Airplane engines, uh, small airplane engines, were of no interest at the time. And so uh, then uh, Andy Wyeth's older brother told me to uh, come put in an application at the DuPont Company. And he was my boss, <laughs> where I started in the engineering department of the DuPont Company under Nat Wyeth and uh, moved on from there. So what, <clears throat> what year was that then, 43? 43, 40, well, oh. 46. Yeah, uh, 46, I, I married, I, I started on the April Fool, started in the DuPont Company on April Fool's Day of 1946. And uh, they moved us from Barbie and me from Arlington, New Jersey, to Parkersburg, West Virginia, to Charleston, West Virginia, and then to uh, Wilmington, Delaware. So we'd, we had a good tour of duty.
This is over what period of years? I mean, how long were you in West Virginia? All right. Well, uh, we were three years in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and two years in Charleston, and uh, came to uh, Wilmington in 1953, and uh, for their uh, had various jobs around the company, and I took early re retirement in 1978, and I've just been a, a laggard ever since. So you were there um, when, when Crawford Greenwald, your brother-in-law, was running the company. Yes, uh, Crawford was... Uh, given the uh, <clears throat> president's chair in 1948. I was at uh, Arlington, New Jersey plant at the time. I remember one of the first plants he came to visit was our plant in North Jersey. And uh, he walked into the uh, uh, field office of the engineering department. There were 11 of us in one room with, uh, with desks filling up every space you could, and the uh, coal pile supplying the boiler, the steam plant for the whole plant was right outside the window. On a hot summer day, you'd open the window and your drawing board would get covered with black uh, coal dust, but we had a brush to brush it off with. And Crawford came in and said some nice things and wanted to know what I was doing. And I showed him the spooling machine that wasn't working very well, and, but it was my fault because I hadn't, I was having trouble developing a way of uh, spooling nylon fish leader on uh, spools without stretching it because it, well, it, it's hard to make a good package if you put it on too tight. So that was your challenge that you were working on when it came that by. That was what hap yeah. I happened to be doing yeah. when yeah. Crawford yeah. was uh, first president. Okay. Spooling fish leader. <laughs> <laughs> you figured it out? Did it work? Uh, like a lot of those problems, the people don't make it find another way to do it. <laughs> the, the fish leader was not one of the bigger problems of the DuPont Company at that time. So in another interview, you talked a lot about um, your recollections of Crawford. Um, is there anything that you want to, well? I don't remember what I said you don't then. Have said. <laughs> no, he was a delight for everybody. Crawford had, uh, had the ability to listen. And he'd find out, wh whoever he sat down with, uh, he'd find out all about them and ask them to get them to tell his, their story to him. And he learned a lot that way. After New Jersey, you then moved on to West Virginia and then back to Wilmington. Well, you left the three years at Ranger Aircraft Engines oh, out. See, right. that tell was us. between 43 yep. and 46. Mm -hmm. And that, that was where... Uh, why the calendar didn't match up. That's right. Right. So, what were those engines used on bombers or they were, transport? The one I was working on, which was their biggest engine, was a 12 cylinder inline V, V12 inline air cooled engine. And uh, it would, was rated at 500 horsepower continuous service and 550 horsepower for five minute takeoffs. But, so it's a small engine by that for military use. They used it in their catapult airplane, the uh, Curtis SO3C, which was the, uh, had a big pontoon for landing on the ocean. 
but it would be fired from a battleship off of a catapult, where it was, uh, was literally shot into the air at flying speed and uh, would go up and do whatever uh, observations were requested by the captain of, the, of a, big, a big ship that was big enough to have a catapult on it. And it was also used on uh, training planes for the Army. And uh, I don't really remember what any, where they, we don't, didn't make an awful lot of them. I'm guessing probably made a few thousand, but that's all. And your, the Ranger manufacturer was the? He was a division so of Fairchild Engine and Airplane Company. Did you ever see one of those catapults? Much earlier, uh, when I was 10 years old, my uh, mother had taken the uh, unmarried daughters and me to see the Oberammergau play. And on the way back, we came back on the Europa, a, a German ship. This was 1930. I was 10 years old and uh, we got up in the morning so that the mail plane would be shot off of the Europa to carry the mail two days out of New York so that uh, it was the fastest way to send mail from Europe to America three days on a ship and, and that, uh, the, the airplane would land it in a matter of hours into New York. And, that was quite a sight to see the catapult fire the German airplane out of it. And it couldn't land on the water. He had, once he was in the air, he had to go. Had to make it the whole way. Yeah. Wow. So how, what was his range? How long would Well, they... it must have been 40% uh, uh, of the trip that the Europa would take, five yeah. days, and yeah. it, it would do uh, the, 40% of, of the crossing time in a matter of a few, of a very few hours. Wow. So this, um, this job with the Ranger uh, got you a deferment from the Army? Yes. Yeah, we were, I was only four, uh, 23 and uh, had, I got deferments and when I turned 26, the Army didn't, wasn't interested in people. It was the war had won, actually the war had been won right. by uh, 1946, but uh, when I left Ranger. But it was uh, an interesting job. Were there, it's interesting, um, Many factories were hiring women because a lot of the men were gone. Is that true of this one? Or? Certainly on the assembly line and uh, in uh, all the clerical work, there were a lot of young ladies there, which was quite interesting for a 23-year-old kid right out of college. I, I lived in a boarding house, and the lady that ran the boarding house uh, was quite aware of the hazard that could be had very easily if she allowed young ladies in. But she had a house full of school teachers and uh, young engineers in their 20s. The school teachers were <laughs> respectfully older. That's great. She kept an orderly house. <laughs> That's great. Wow. Um. So what did your sisters do during the war? Did any of them have wartime jobs? Yes, the, my sisters did great things. Uh, the, right here uh, at Grenoble, Delaware, there was a railroad station and post office, a fourth class post office in a little shed down the hill. and. Uh, when the, the um, postmaster retired and 
They were looking, they had, couldn't find somebody to replace the postmaster. So my two of my sisters, my oldest one and my number four sister, who lived nearby, shared the job of a postmaster. And uh, the, uh, they, for their services, the federal government paid $500 to the postmaster. So each sister got $250 a year reimbursement for their time. And they, it was a lot of work. They had to do the mail and keep track of the postage stamps and do all the government bureaucratic stuff. During the war, they managed it. That was two of the eight girls. One of the girls, well, there were, there were only seven by that time. One of my sisters died at, at age 21. And uh, so uh, the number two sister married Crawford Greenwald, and you know all about that. And that, she went out to Hanford quite a bit lived out there for a while and made her trips out there and did traveling with him. Uh, another sister uh, married a congressman from Virginia who uh, in the U.S. Congress, U.S. congressman and so she, she moved to Norfolk, Virginia on, at the time of her marriage in 1927. And I'm, by the time the war came, uh, uh, the congressman Colgate Darden had been uh, become governor of Virginia. So she had her hands full during the war. After the war, uh, the uh, Colgate uh, found himself as president of the University of Virginia, and he had a he had to fix a big problem down there too. But uh, she was busy. Doris, the one that died, uh, Eleanor was shared the post office with uh, Sophie. Uh, Mariana married a, a Yale guy who uh, had uh, he, he he was good. He uh, had been uh, with a uh, a securities broker, but when the war came, he joined the Navy and uh, did well and became captain, uh, chief officer of the, uh, of a um, mine sweep. It was a good size uh, a diesel driven boat. That would, uh, so he was, he, he did time in the Pacific and and uh, Tibby, uh, she uh, went to New York. Went to New York and got hired by one of the big hospitals up there, and, and met a doctor who was interested in uh, treating cancer with uh, radi radium or uh, nuclear materials, and. She spent the war working in that laboratory. Lucille married a, uh, a chemist in the DuPont Company, Bob Flint, and raised a family and did what a good wife should do in a man who was making uh, uh, secret stuff in the DuPont Company. We never found out. I never talked much about what Bob Clint was doing. After the war, he got a job looking at patents or something. So that accounted for all seven of my surviving sisters. None of them are survived to this time. That's curious about uh, Crawford's wife, Margarita. I didn't realize that she spent time in Hanford. I think I think they had a they had a, a house assigned to them for a while. Yeah, she was out there with her three little kids. 
Well, let's see. Yeah, they were uh, all three of them. I think, I think they kept somebody back home. The children never went out there, to my knowledge. I see. So that might have been uh, a matter of just a few months that she was in Hanford. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any stories? What was her? <laughs> We didn't know no anything. Report. We didn't wouldn't have mm -hmm. heard that she was she would when she disappeared. She was going to see where her husband was. And, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, totally secret. No, never had an inkling. Hmm. My uh, knowledge of the uh, of uh, the Manhattan Project uh, occurred when I was at Ranger. Uh, I was running a single cylinder engine running knock limited mixture response curves on a single one ranger one ranger cylinder barrel on a little experimental machine and uh, my boss came in and he said Brip stop the engine oh Hugh look I've just got the temperatures are going right we're getting good data now shut it down what, what's the trouble? What's going on? They've dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. What's an atomic bomb? Where is Hiroshima? <laughs> but that was how that I had I had no idea that uh, what was going on in Crawford's line, and it suddenly realized that that must be what Crawford was doing. It took me about all until supper time that day before I put enough together. When did you um, confirm that with him? Do you remember? Oh, well, everything came out in the paper very soon, and the, we even used long-distance telephone calls to go from Farmingdale, New York, to Wilmington, Delaware. I talked to my father, and he described what he knew and it was uh, and we Barbie and I would come weekends every now and then down to Delaware and get acquainted we'd go to New Hampshire to her family too so it was uh, we would spend most of our weekends one way or the other So do you think your, your father knew more about what Crawford was up to during the war, or was that? Oh, I'm sure he did. See, he was on the board of directors. I see. And uh, they were all aware. But that, as far as I know, was it. And they were all warned not to ask questions, to pretend they didn't know anything. Yeah, he knew he knew what it was, and uh, I'm sure he shared all of their concerns about whether Germany was getting ahead of us or not. Right. It was certainly the big issue. Right. It, it was. Um, but one of the things that um, is a theme of one of the things that DuPont and I have learned working on this project for 20 years is how concerned DuPont has been with safety and with the health and well-being of their employees. And yes. The, uh, it's, uh, the, the origin of that interest in safety really goes long a great distance back to, uh, and it didn't didn't only include the DuPont company. Everybody that made gunpowder knew how careful you had to be. Uh, in fact, uh, for hundreds of years, uh, gun manufacturers of gunpowder had a very bad name. That they knew they didn't last very long. Now, back in uh, 1774. King Louis the Sixteenth of France uh, 
started his reign, and he uh, followed his grandfather or great grandfather Henry the, uh, Louis the Fifteenth, the Spendthrift King, and uh, uh, France was in a an economic mess at the time, and it was up to Louis the Sixteenth to do something about it, and so uh, Louis the Sixteenth heard that there was a, a Frenchman who really was beginning to understand chemistry. His name was Anton Lavoisier, the father of modern chemistry, he's known that. And Louis the Sixteenth uh, fingered uh, Anton Lavoisier and made him uh, uh, director of the new powder plant that was being built by the French government at Asson, outside of Paris. And the King Louis XVI looked to Anton Lavoisier in the eye and he said, now, I don't want any of my subjects blown up in your powder plant. <laughs> it's my powder plant, but you're, you're to run it so safely and to be sure that you run it safely, you're gonna build your house right in the middle of that plant and keep your family there while you're at work. That was King Louis the Sixteenth, putting it pretty plainly, which they which all of this happened. And uh, so all that was done as the king said, and uh, a chap named uh, Eliathier Irene de Pont was 17 years old, and his father knew Lavoisier and said, would you take my son and, uh, as an apprentice and learn how to do what you're doing? Which he did. And, uh, and the apprentice lived in the house with the boss, and this young kid, uh, uh, did all of the uh, experimenting and re recording, uh, keeping data and quality control, I guess you would call it. And he, uh, he probably wrote home to his dad. He said, look, I, you know where I am? I'm right, living right in the middle of this damn powder plant. <laughs> and the, Mr. Lavoisier doesn't let me do anything except work. <laughs> So uh, from that, we certainly can, so it's pretty clear that the real father of industrial safety was none other than Louis XVI of France. Uh, the DuPont Company followed uh, that procedure, and when uh, E.I. DuPont came to America and built his powder plant, he built the residence on the little hillock right overlooking the, uh, the uh, machinery of, that was making gunpowder uh, just a couple of few hundred yards away. And uh, they had a very good record. They started the plant, the uh, company was, uh, it was, uh, Founded in 1802, but they first started making gunpowder two years later, 1804. And their first fatality was in 1815. So they had 11 good years without a, without a fatality. Now, uh, they didn't keep records on people hitting their hands with a hammer or doing all the other things that can cause inconveniences when, on the, in the in industry, but it, uh, that, was, uh, that was a good record. Uh, I guess the, the, the next real test of industrial safety came in a uh, hundred years later when they started making gunpowder for World War I because that was when the company scaled up big time. And uh, 
they uh, they didn't do so well, and of course it was a much, much bigger organization by then. They had plants scattered all over the United States, and then for World War I, they uh, uh, built an enormous gun cotton factory on the banks of the of uh, the uh, river um, in Virginia. The, uh, why don't, can't I say it? The, the Rappahannock? No, this the is James. a big one. The James River. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> they built, built the Hopewell plant on the James River and did all the nitrating at that one site. And uh, they would bring shiploads of uh, sodium nitrate up from Chile and dumped the whole ship load in there, mixing it with, uh, with, uh, uh, with cellulose from all sources, wood pulp, or anything they could find, corn stalks, whatever, and uh, uh, nitric acid. And that, w that had to be done very carefully but it was manageable. They did it for the whole, they just built a whole lot of nitrators, uh, over a hundred nitrators doing what, what a nitrator in a, in a single gunpowder factory would do. And then you could ship the, the gun cotton that came out of that safely on a barge or in, a, in railroad cars or anything that was that, that, that they knew how to do that safely and it, it all it would do would be burn anyway it wouldn't uh, wouldn't detonate and uh, so they that system worked uh, they, they shipped the gun cotton to all the other powder plants of the United States both Hercules and Atlas and DuPont and uh, that record was not so good. They, uh, uh, 50, 1917, I think there were 117 fatalities. So uh, my father got to be president in 1918, and he said, we're going to get into this safety thing big time, and hired uh, Du Bois, what was his first name. And they uh, worked out a program that would <clears throat> uh, get every, every employee excited about safety and believing in it. And they, it worked. And they ran for safety, made safety records far better than any other industry, even uh, I mean, uh, you know, gunpowder and uh, things that they made were were hazardous to begin with, but it was a lot safer than working in a textile plant or wherever. Well, that culture certainly uh, comes through in all of mm -hmm. our interviews with people who worked for DuPont at Hanford. They. Um, sometimes joke about how many safety lectures they get. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they were, they volunteer how yeah. um, much they appreciated that. Well, safety is a, something that anybody can understand. And so if you got a new man that's coming on the job and you want to open a conversation, that's the first thing you do is to talk about the safety and you can walk around the play, workplace that he's going to be at and point out the different features as fire extinguishers and safety showers and uh, how necessary it is to act quickly if there's a, an accident. Okay. So do you know, I mean, I have not seen any figures or heard anything about the other than that the DuPont record at Hanford was very very safe I don't think mm -hmm. there was any exception 
Well, I remember at, at Parkersburg, <clears throat> I was an area engineer in the nylon part of it, making fish leader and brush bristle and uh, the thing, <clears throat> things that were not textile out of nylon. And we had a, a situation where one of the pipes got clogged up. It was full of hot nylon salt. And it's ready to go, ready to be charged into a uh, autoclave in those days, and uh, it was quitting time. And uh, we had, I had two of my mechanics were working to, with the uh, operating people to try to help them get this thing unclogged. And both of the men that it reported to me were up its ceiling height on this array of pipes overhead. And uh, they had opened the pipe at both ends and nothing came out and there was this valve in the middle of it going off to the side and it was stuck. So they had to take the bonnet off the valve and uh, everybody in the, in the uh, operating department assured us that it was it couldn't be anything in that pipe that would come out suddenly but of course there was <laughs> when they cracked the bonnet open it, a sheet of uh, steam and nylon salt came out and hit these two guys that worked for me and I, I remember uh, 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 Charlie Parsons, he slid, He was an older man, and he slid down off them. And I caught him as he before he hit the floor, and the safety shower was 12 feet away. And I pulled the handle, and we both got took a shower together. <laughs> and uh, he had been scalded superficially. The other guy had actually got down himself and had not been seriously. He got his clothes dirty, that's about all. But Charlie Parsons uh, was classified as a minor injury. We got him, uh, what took him to the hospital and he was examined and he was back at work the next morning. So that was not a major injury, but uh, that was uh, first hand in being there and see how the thing works, it was a good drill. One of the, the themes we're going to be trying to pursue, looking at all of the innovations that the Manhattan Project had to do because everything was yeah. brand new, hadn't been done. So building a reactor, creating oh a chemical God. separation plant and so forth required um, ingenuity and, and teamwork and multidisciplinary you know, collaboration of a sort that um, isn't, you know, wasn't usual for, for the times. Well, the, uh, the company was successful in that particular project because they could overwhelm the problem with so many different options that one of them was bound to work in the, in the conceptual stage. Yeah. And uh, uh, that, that just took a, a lot of Uncle Sam's money in those days. The whole thing was done for two billion dollars, as I recall, and, uh, and that's pretty small for by t today's comparison. But of course, those dollars were, were would be worth twenty-five or forty dollars today. So it's a, each, it's a, it is pretty hard to describe it, but it would have been a. You can certainly multiply it by 40 or 50 fold to what it would, have, what yeah. would require today. Yeah. And it would be impossible because you would have to have so many, many um, uh, forms to fill out and uh, you would have to do things that uh, would be required and they, they couldn't have found the land to build it on in the first place. It's pretty remarkable. I think what 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 uh, they were able to achieve. Yeah. But um, um, so you you come from a 
very storied family, and it's wonderful to hear about all your sisters, uh, at least what they did in World War II. They did. They were good girls. Yeah, yeah. So, um... And Connie with her violin. She uh, took violin lessons as a little girl and stayed with it for her life. Connie Darden. Oh. And uh, you, I tell about her because she uh, shared it with people. She was struck by some of the older viols, vi stringed instruments, and wanted to learn how to play the viola d'amour. The 14-string violin had seven strings that you bow and then resonating strings down lower under the uh, bridge of the violin. It gave it a very interesting stone quality. And she went to uh, Ben Stad, S-T-A-D. Ben Stad was a um, violin teacher who also knew how to play a lot of things in Philadelphia and he lived in a little row house in a busy street and she stopped her Buick out in front of his house and walked in and introduced herself. I want to get lessons on a viola de Moore. and he looked out the window and saw the Buick Roadster and looked at her and wanted to get rid of her real fast. So he said, well, I don't, don't really teach about the viola de Moore, and uh, I, I, I couldn't do it. Well, how much would you charge for a lesson? I mean, $40. Oh, that's good. I'll pay that. <laughs> and uh, she made friends with and found out, he found out that she was serious, and, of course, the friendship developed that... Uh, and he uh, had a, an ensemble, the uh, Society of the Ancient Instruments, and he played his premier uh, concert in this very room right here in 1927. And uh, that was the beginning of, of, of a very successful development, at least in Philadelphia, of the, preservation of, of uh, in ancient instruments on a playing period uh, music for a lot of people that enjoyed it. Oh, what a great story. Looks like you have an organ back there as well. Is that right? Yeah. The <laughs> Goodness me, this room that, is... Uh, uh, the organ was built into the house, and the house was built in 1923, and the organ was playing the day they walked in. It was played by perforated paper rolls like a player piano, and, uh, but it was a true pipe organ with uh, 1,200 pipes, and it's a small 23-rank organ, as they call it, uh, made by the Aeolian uh, Aeolian Pipe Organ Company of uh, uh, up in New North Jersey. Well, anyway, uh, the family enjoyed it very much, and we have it uh, in operating condition today. But instead of perforated paper rolls, we have a computer that collected all of those holes and spaces between them, uh, and. Uh, but we play, can play all of the old music along with the, what modern people play on the keys when they feel like it, too. A lot of people in interviews talk about DuPont's experimental station. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about what that was? Yes. All right. Uh, now, a lot of that innovation you were ta talking about is uh, done at what we call here in Wilmington the experimental station. Uh, Hercules has one, but they call it the experiment station. Ours is the experimental station. Uh, you can argue about the name all you want, but it's a, a group of very uh, 
well knowledgeable people in the sciences to, working together to try to solve industrial problems. Uh, I don't have the figures, but uh, I'm guessing it's a must be a near 50 acre site of buildings uh, close together and full of uh, all kinds of scientific uh, laboratories. Uh, I'm fine, we'll have to find uh, the, the numbers that go with it, but the type of people that work there are all interesting. They, you would like uh, every one of them, even the people that come in to sweep the floor are type of people you'd like to invite home, uh, meet, have dinner with your wife, you know. It's a, they're all friendly and excellent caliber people working together. Uh, it, uh, it's hard to describe because I, I never actually worked in the experimental, and you're any doing experiments in the experimental station. Is that any help? Yes, um, uh, just a number of Manhattan Project veterans, it sounded like, started there before they went to work yeah. on the Manhattan Project. So it seems like it's been around oh, yeah. a very long time. Oh, yes. The experimental station, <laughs> experimental station has been there since uh, before the turn of the 20th century. It was uh, <clears throat> uh, built in an old powder mill at first. And uh, the purpose, of course, was to improve the quality of the gunpowder, being the, made, the, the almost the only product the DuPont Company made. At that time, it had become smokeless powder, so that it was uh, it was real chemistry rather than uh, alchemy of gunpowder, of uh, black powder. The numbers of people that were working in the experimental station in uh, 1940 must have been quite a large number because they had just completed the uh, 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 commercialization of nylon. And the nylon was big, but then there were many other products too. They were all kinds of paint finishes, and there were agricultural growing aids, and there were uh, uh, plastics. Uh, it was a, a busy place and uh, full of uh, capable scientists working. So it was a gold mine for the kind of people that would could be trained to consider making plutonium, if you could call it that name, but that, that's, they wouldn't have known at that time what they were talking about. So it was a, it was a great, uh, a great uh, hiring ground for the Manhattan Project. So in, in terms of what research was like before World War II, and the government, you know, invested so heavily in the Manhattan Project and radar and other mm -hmm. efforts, you know, at universities to to compete uh, with war-related uh, innovation. Um, the government really didn't have very many uh, research dollars. Mm -hmm. So, what were the big? How did research happen? I mean. Well, of course, research, most of it was done at the university level on pure science. And the military had some pretty big installations. The government was big in, in, in explosives. And of course, the government had, uh, had done all the work on, on uh, military specialties, detonating charges, which don't have much use in, in industry, in building harbors and railroads. But so it was uh, learning back in World War I, uh, it was learning to convert uh, industrial 
gunpowder or dynamite or whatever the uh, industrial explosives were, learning to make the complicated uh, molecules in, uh, in TNT and, and uh, picric acid and all those sort of things for, uh, that, had, that had to be done quickly in World War I and I suppose had to do it all over again for World War II where the new explosives were far more, far more sophisticated. Being a member of the DuPont family, is, did you feel growing up a lot of, I guess, pressure as a result of the, just having that name uh, or expectation? It was more of a nuisance than anything else. Uh, kids in, in school, would, how, how much allowance do you get, you know? Well, I got 75 cents when everybody else got only a quarter. But so you tell them the truth and... That's it. But, uh, and that's the way it was. And with that $3 a month that my father gave me, I didn't have any place to spend it. And so I, without my father's permission, I bought a Model T Ford at age 12. <laughs> at age 12? Yeah. Well, I, 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 could, I knew how to drive a regular car by then. I had been, my sisters had taught me all that. It was just a matter of crouching down and pushing on that clutch pedal, which was a long stretch for somebody who isn't full length yet. But at 12, I had gotten long enough to really push the clutch pedal even before that. But yeah, I think I first drove my sister's Buick at age seven. Oh my. I backed it out of the garage while she watched. <laughs> so did you, your dad allow you to keep the car? At, yes. Yeah? It so happened that my cousin's nurse, Ben DuPont's nurse, had been, of course, she stayed on in the family as other children arrived younger than Ben. and. Uh, her husband worked at the uh, DuPont uh, flying field as a uh, serviceman on the aircraft. And he had the Model T that was for sale. So uh, Hackendorn's Model T was, I had, I had the privilege of being driven over to buy it with $15 that I had saved from <laughs> five months savings of all went into that Ford. And uh, he had some kind of a registration on it, which uh, our chauffeur, Ernest McClay, uh, figured was good enough to get us home on. And he, uh, Ernest drove the car, and I, I uh, sat in the dry, uh, passenger seat, and uh, Charlie Walls sat in the back seat. He'd come along just for the fun to see him. Driving in an old Ford. It was an old Ford. It was only eight years old, a 1924 Ford, but it was, it lived outdoors, had no top, and somebody had put a, a, a quilted tablecloth for upholstery over the back seat, which looked pretty nice. <laughs> and uh, we drove it home. Uh, halfway home, the throttle control, which was made out of coat hanger wire, broke. And uh, so Ernie gave me a stick and said, now you work the throttle from your seat and I'll tell you if you want more gas or less. <laughs> With a Ford, it wasn't much difference between idling and full throttle, you know. And so we got it home and I drove it around. My, my people that reported to my father were horrified. Told my father, we could fix that Ford so it'll never run again. My father, let him have it now. Let's see, what does it need? It does need a safety, it needs safety glass in the windshield. <laughs> he, and he didn't say anything. I agreed, I needed safety glass in the windshield too. So he gave me $12 to put the safety glass in the windshield, <laughs> almost as much as the car cost. 
And I played with that car until I got a motorcycle. And, uh, and when I was 16, my father uh, gave me the Oldsmobile, which is out in the garage there today. So, well, you've certainly taken good care of these. <laughs> I wish I had the Ford. I traded it for a new bandsaw, <laughs> and somebody else had it. I needed a bandsaw. <laughs> the Ford was, had, wasn't too much of it still useful, but it would run. Well, from your story about your days at Dartmouth, where you discovered you like tinkering with the Car. I decided when I bought the Cadillac, I didn't realize that I was also going to change colleges, change a career, and <laughs> be kept out of the war, be kept out, uh, avoiding, I was uh, avoiding the draft, but I didn't know that at the time. How did the, the nylon revolutionize the DuPont company? Well, nylon, of course, it was the biggest thing that ever happened to the DuPont company, without doubt. Uh, it was started as research in the laboratory, and Wallace Carruthers came up with a molecule that was uh, just what was needed for all the, all the uses of fibers, plastics, and the uh, and uh, it, so it started as a elegant piece of uh, research in polymer chemistry and came out as the biggest money maker the DuPont company had, has ever seen or even thought of uh, by, by uh, the full commercialization of nylon in the uh, 50s, 1950s. It accounted for 50% of the company's profits and 30% of the company's sales. So that was a, a, a tremendous effect. And then, of course, it had the downside of it was that people began to think that you could do it again. And uh, we would say, well, now take, for instance, nylon. Here you do this. Take, for instance, nylon. But nothing ever came anywhere close to following that level of success. And uh, why it was so successful, again, it uh, was that the caliber of the people that were working on it wanted to make it a success. There was a, a market, such a very diverse market for it that uh, uh, everything that could be dreamed up had a place, had, had a place for, uh, in, in the commercial world. So for it was a, a great uh, turning, major turning point for the DuPont Company, and uh, it lasted for a very long time. And uh, they, it had, it last, lasted uh, when it became uh, no longer a, uh, uh, a patented process. The company, DuPont Company. Uh, extended its its profitability by further research in in the mechanical field, where they uh, developed uh, winding machines that could wind up at near the speed of sound. That they they were uh, they had what they called the coupled process, where you're spinning this string of nylon and it has to be stretched fourfold so that it goes. It's going through the stretcher, coming out of the stretcher four times as fast as it comes out of the nozzle when it's being formed uh, from a liquid into a solid. Well, then, uh, if that's if that's going pretty fast out of that nozzle, now you have to wind it up very fast because uh, to keep up. So that before the uh, coupled process, they would wind it up at the slow speed and then run it through the stretcher uh, as in batches 
uh, at a more comfortable speed, but it took a lot of stretchers to handle one spinning machine. Then somebody in the uh, engineering department, maybe I'm not, don't know, and I'll, the name escaped me. I never heard anyone got credit for that one. It was a team effort, obviously, but they could wind it up as at the the faster speed for quite a long time before uh, some people in in Switzerland made started selling machines that would do the same thing, and then then became, that's when nylon became a com commodity instead of a money maker for the Devant company. You said it was a problem because people thought, oh, we can make the next nylon. Yeah. Yeah. It would, you, you would say, for example, nylon. It was a word that you don't <laughs> need no example other than nylon. Yeah. It, one of, the, one of the, the mysteries of the Manhattan Project, which um, from things I read in the DuPont's 200 and further history uh, is what was the use of Teflon? Was there any use of Teflon in the Manhattan Project? I, I wouldn't know that. I know that it was being made at Arlington in very small amounts when I got there in 1946. And it had been, the, the purpose of it was to make the cones over uh, proximity fuse r projectiles. They wanted to make <clears throat> projectiles that would detonate just before they hit, instead of after they hit. And uh, they uh, did that by putting a high frequency radio in the front of the shell that would uh, look through, could see through the uh, Teflon and, uh, and nothing else could seem to make those fuses possible. So they had that a big uh, high seek, very big secrecy effort around that Teflon building, which was still no longer secret when I got there, but it was a, and the Teflon process itself is an explosive, about the same intensity of black powder. So you make it in a in a, a three-sided building where you can blow the top and the side off for the same reason as the black powder. Uh, I think it was Herbert Anderson asked Crawford Greenwald during the Manhattan Project, uh, "Will you be going into nuclear power after the war?" And Greenwald says, "No, nylon is more profitable." So did Dupont ever regret? Did the company ever regret not That's a good gone? question, and I can tell you the answer. <laughs> the, uh, uh, why didn't the DuPont company go into nuclear activity after World War One, after World War II? Uh, <clears throat> well, with Crawford Greenwald as chairman, having been himself DuPont's number one man in the Manhattan Project, both he and all of the uh, people that worked on the, from DuPont in the uh, Manhattan Project had a ringside seat on what was going on in the nuclear power possibilities. And uh, very wisely, they saw that make nuclear power was going to be more of a political problem than an industrial problem. They saw that they could anticipate what was going to happen, that it would be regulated completely. And uh, so they elected not to, uh, to pursue it. And Westinghouse and General Electric, of course, went headlong into it and they lost their shirts because of, well, you've seen what has happened in, in nuclear power, and it has, it's really a political, uh, I would guess it's an ideological issue rather than uh, uh, 
solving engineering problems. So you can say that I uh, don't know how many gazillions of dollars Westinghouse and Electric spent on it. DuPont didn't have to spend that. They saved that amount of money by not doing it. So in that sense, it was very profitable not to do it. So they didn't have long discussions. It was not a difficult decision. No. No, it was not. As far as I know, I wasn't upstairs yeah. in the company at that time when they were making the decisions, but it was, right. it was pretty unanimous. Right. But then DuPont got dragged back into to building... Uh, yeah, the Savannah River plant. But it was again done for a dollar. That was an... I don't know whether I should tell this or not. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. I was on the board. When, uh, when uh, Seagram's, Bronfman's, when the Bronfman's had 25% uh, of the board were Bronfman people. And uh, so there came time to talk about how Savannah River was going and the Savannah River people representatives told the board about what they were doing and a Bronfman from Canada said, well, why are we doing this? Nobody knew. I was the youngest kid on the board, I suppose, from DuPont, so I, I didn't know how. I was, I was kind of shocked because I didn't know why we were doing it either. And. Uh, so the board said, we're going to get out, we'll, we're, let's find a graceful way to discontinue and get out of it. And I should have stood up and I should have said, the only reason for DuPont ever getting into any of this was purely patriotism. We, we received a dollar for the Manhattan Project and we received a second dollar for the Savannah River project, but there's no motivation for it in the DuPont company other than patriotism and sat out. But I didn't. I, I think that the Bronfmans were right. We should have gotten out of it because uh, actually it turned out that that's what a, that was the time to get out while you were still ahead. <laughs> still had a good name in it. I thought it was pretty tricky in the 50s and the Cold War and yeah. pressure on you from, I'm sure, Truman and then Eisenhower. Um, well, it, it, it had to, somebody had to do it. Yeah. And, uh, and who else had the know-how? Yeah, that's right. Did you know Roger Williams? The uh, older one, uh, the one that was in the Manhattan work? Yeah. I had met him, I'm sure, but I, I don't particularly remember. His yeah. son worked at the Bell plant for a while, and his ghost was still there when I was at, at, uh, in Charleston, West Virginia. But he was a high runner. That son was a high roller down there, and he left quite a swath behind him. Huh. Um. So is it, it sounds as if it's, at least in your experience, DuPont likes to move people around to different parts of the company. They did. And, and that, is that true today as well? I should imagine so. I have no way of knowing, but uh, yeah. there are not nearly as many people. It isn't a big bureaucracy anymore. The company, when I was coming up through the ranks, was an enormous bureaucracy. And I remember one of the first job I had in, in Wilmington was to help write uh, some of these reports that were sent up through the various, through our department, polychemicals department, to the general manager, and then he would send the information on to the board of directors or the executive committee, and then they would send it to the board of directors. And it was ridiculous, the amount of stuff we had to detail that we would put in our 
monthly reports. And of course, what we were doing, they were teaching young kids how to write and be part of a bureaucracy, which was good. And of course, they were teaching so many that they would go out and find better jobs with other companies, and that was part of the uh, education of America, if you will, in that part of the industry. But uh, it was wasteful because it didn't produce any, any profits for the DuPont Company. And that's what uh, the new company has avoided very, very well. And they've cut the number of uh, mid-management mid down the jobs down to a bare minimum. They even eliminated foremen in the plants. There'd be a, manage, a man, plant manager and a, a circle of lieutenants around him. And uh, then the hourly paid uh, workers, instead of reporting to a foreman, would write down things that would be on the, for the day shift of a management to read. And with that, they, of course, with everything being mechanized, there were very relatively few, but there isn't anybody for the unions to organize left because uh, they're, they're not managers. They're working, turning the valves or running the computers that can run the plant. And what do you want to call them? Are they managers or are they, uh, well, at least they, they are not type of people that would, quest, would, would want to join a union. If they'd have long left if they didn't like the job they were in. So that's a really, that's how the company has gone from 150,000 people working in America to down to something like 60,000 now, maybe 50,000, I don't know, but it's like a third of what they used to be. And, and that is reflective of, of all their plants worldwide. This is not just the American force has shrunk. Yeah, I Twitter. presume that it's worldwide. I don't know about the, whether there's about the number that, that 150 versus 50 or 60 is uh, America only is from what I've heard and I, I don't, don't know. Well, your father gets credit for coming up with um, the mine and staff organization. Mm -hmm. The of executive Maine. committee. Yeah. And that worked, but it, uh, I think Shapiro proved that it wasn't a, it wasn't needed anymore. Do you want to describe what it was? Can you tell us a little bit about what about it was? What the executive committee did? Yeah, what, what your dad came up with and the two. Oh, all right. Uh, well, now, well how, how, how does the top management of a company like DuPont, like Nylon, like DuPont work? Uh, the, uh, my father got this job of president of the DuPont Company, and uh, the DuPont Company to him had been something that worked very hard during World War I, but here it was now uh, buying uh, new processes from Europe like rayon, cellophane, and uh, uh, they were, uh, what do you, how do you manage that? And my father felt, I guess the way I would, he felt sort of out uh, over his depth in how to do this thing. And he, he was used to working with other people to get, right? so he thought, well, I'll have the executive committee to do this job of managing the company. And they'll find all the good people in the company that could do that. And We'll have a little club to discuss each of these items. Now, I don't know how big the committee was when he started it, but it was nine, including the president. There were eight other vice presidents, and uh, I just I was a had a seat in that committee. I can't think of anything I did that helped it out, but it was I was there. 
And uh, they would talk earnestly about all the issues. And uh, I remember uh, Bob Hershey said, well, all I do is read and vote. <laughs> Uh, what's your job description? <laughs> and sometimes I'd go visit plants and see how they were, uh, what that was about. I got a trip to Jap Japan and uh, China at company expense to see you learn about that. But uh, that was for me. I, the company didn't gain anything out of that. Uh, but... Uh, they would, they would, the other uh, seven, and uh, President uh, Brel McCoy, uh, they would sit around every, uh, all day, every Wednesday, discussing these matters. And uh, Shapiro came on the board, and uh, then he was elected president. And he said, we're not going to do that anymore. And uh, he invited me to retire while I was uh, also president of Christiana Securities with the uh, obligation to uh, manage 24% uh, of the DuPont's outstanding stock. So he felt, did feel he had to ask me whether I would resign or not, and I told him, not until you fold the Christiana into your company, but I, I'm, I have my constituents that I have to stay on your board until, uh, and, until you've done away with us, which they did buy it out. And, uh, when uh, then he didn't want me to leave too soon after that because he thought that would be bad publicity. But so I stayed a few months and left. So he brought in a new form of a single yeah, executor. Uh, they do it more modern ways. I yeah. don't know, uh, right. but I, I'm sure he had somebody around him, three or four or five people. I don't know how many, but they had other assignments, and, and of course computers were taking over at that time. Yeah. So that uh, I'd have really been out of my <laughs> <laughs> ability when that happened. <coughs> well, that's interesting. So DuPont proves to be a very adaptable company. Yeah, and Shapiro made it happen. Give him full credit. He, he had been uh, the general counsel, is he a lawyer, yeah, is that right? He had yeah. In general counsel. Right. And he had led uh, DuPont through the uh, General Motors case before as an outside, uh, first as an outside attorney hired and then as an employee for uh, the, ca the uh, case which ultimately divested General Motors. The, from <coughs> the DuPont company. Right, right. It's sort of interesting, just looking at the history, how your father, it, it, at least seem to have been good friends of Alfred P. Sloan, Jr., the president of mm -hmm. General Motors, and they were both um, running huge corporations. And yeah. Well, that was, of course, my father's older brother that okay. <coughs> purchased the <coughs> shares in General Motors. Right. And uh, they had a real, uh, what sounded like a rather simple problem that was killing General Motors. Why, why did DuPont get uh, acquire outstanding stock of General Motors Corporation in 1920? It was after the World War One. the uh, that even Pierre Dupont didn't know how much more how much was going to be paid in after the after producing all that gunpowder for the various nations because a lot of the uh, contracts were unfulfilled and and uh, but the money kept coming in so there was a surplus of cash after World War One 
what do we do with the cash? Well, we got a, got a big staff of uh, engineering know-how here, so Pierre said we'll, we'll do, take on some public works that will be self-liquidating. And he uh, said, here's one we need is a, uh, a, a, a marine terminal for Wilmington, Delaware. And we'll build a shoreside uh, process and equipment and space for landing all the cargoes of ocean-going ships right here in Delaware and have railheads for them and all the things they need. And we'll build that, and then the other thing we need in Wilmington is a uh, housing development for uh, professionals and mid-management people. And we'll build Wawasset Park. And both of those, of course, were something that could be sold very well. Wawasset Park would be sold when people bought the houses. Or, uh, they bought the lots that they themselves would build houses on. And uh, the marine terminal uh, would be self-liquidating because it was a terminal that would provide the shoreside services for sh ships that couldn't go all the way to Philadelphia. It was a channel that gets smaller. So uh, that's those were the first two public works projects that Pierre DuPont used for parking this extra cash that was coming in. Uh, then his friend, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, no, his, they uh, had to uh, build a, <clears throat> they saw there were business opportunities elsewhere in the country and William Durant's General Motors had uh, was handling building a lot of cars, <clears throat> but it wasn't making any money. And uh, John Raskob said, "I think I know why they're not making any money." <laughs> and Pierre said, "Well, how do you know that?" And he said, "Because I've seen some of their books." <laughs> and <laughs> well, tell me about it. And sure enough, what they had was a system where all the different uh, automobile companies and suppliers that were made up General Motors were independent corporations and would simply pay their profits to General Motors. Well, it doesn't take any, anybody would, uh, would know that those profits weren't going to be very much. And they were going to get you get distributed before the general before uh, William, before William Durant ever saw them, so he uh, put the Dupont Company system in order, where any dollars paid to the Dupont Company for any product or service anywhere goes to the Treasurer's Department first, and then gets distributed back to the organization that produced it. And so they have to have a, a, central, uh, a central recipient for uh, the incoming dollars. And that put General Motors in a highly profitable position overnight. So that's how they got into it and uh, as a they bought bought all the outstanding shares that were available, and and then put some management into the into General Motors, which included a, a Alfred P. Sloan, to uh, see that it happened, and he made it go. Interesting. Yeah, I think I read that the Dupont had. Uh, Gotten something like two hundred and fifty million dollars of profit in World War One. This was a sizable amount of excess cash on hand. Well, I don't know how much it was, but it was yeah. big, and yeah. probably a lot bigger than got re that you gets reported in the, by the <laughs> historians. Yeah. yeah. No, it was a. 
they, they started out, <clears throat> you know, at, uh, uh, with this contract with the British and the French in 1914. And you know that story, or uh, did we well, talk? Well, tell, tell us. Well, how did, how did DuPont get into uh, big time munitions business? In, uh, and it started in 1914 when uh, the British and the French had to fight a war against the Germans and they didn't have any source of gunpowder or munitions to fight with. Uh, so they came to America and said, you make a lot of uh, industrial explosives and you know something about in the military explosives. What can we do to, what can you do to supply our needs? Well, what are your needs? Our needs, well, we have to have 60 million pounds of various explosives right now and we'll need a hundred million pounds per year for until this war is over. Well, the DuPont Company's capacity was 10 million pounds. And here they needed 60 million pounds right now. What can you do? And uh, Pierre turned to Chief Engineer William Ramsey and he said, what do you think we can do? He said, well, let me, let me go look it over. William Ramsey, the chief engineer, said, we'll look, I'll look it over. Three days later, he came back and said, yes, we can do it. What do you mean? Yeah, well, they wanted $16, 60 million dollars right now, which is very soon. And he came up with that uh, engineering program for, uh, for building a big gun, gun cotton plant on, on the James River and doing all the nitration in one place and then sending the gun cotton safely by barge or by rail to all the existing powder plants which were converted then to making whatever military explosives was needed. And uh, the bill was going to come, they needed in those days, it was uh, some ridiculously small amount, uh, like 40, 50 million or something. I don't know for all this. Uh, uh, so, okay, we can do it. Uh, how then, of course, Pierre had to face up to how are we going to finance it? And he came up with the idea that uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll charge a uh, uh, dollar a pound for the explosives, which were costing 53 cents on the open market at the time. We'll charge a dollar until we've paid off the expenses of building these plants and rebuilding the powder plants and building the big plant. And then from then on, we will reduce the uh, price of the gunpowder so that DuPont gets 5% profit out of the, for the whole thing, the, five, with five, the traditional 5%. And the British all agreed that that was the thing to do, but then he had to go out and borrow enough money to start building these plants and building the big one in, and of course the big banks in New York realized that England and France probably were going to be taken over by Germany and they wouldn't pay, uh, wouldn't pay for the powder and they would lose, they would, it was a bad loan. But one of the banks in New York, and I wish I could tell you the name of it, but it escapes me, uh, said, yeah, we'll do it. And they made the loan, made the loans, which was partial amounts over a period of time, so it wasn't like all at once. And they built the plant, they got the plant uh, 90 days after the contract was signed, gunpowder was coming off of the first, or gun cotton was coming out of the first line. 
90 days to get, get the first part of the plant going. And of course, by the end of the year, they had put 60 million, dollars, 60 million pounds had gone overseas. And then they kept enlarging all the way through the war time, and so that the one and a half billion pounds was, had been uh, uh, contributed to the Allied forces, which was a 40 percent of their need. They got, where they got the 60 percent was through other European sources. But uh, that's how they got the big money at the end of the war it was from the 5 percent of this very large flow of gunpowder. And uh, that made it possible to uh, keep the, the uh, wartime workforce intact and made the, uh, and the French and the, uh, the Germans too were, were supplied the uh, know-how for a diversified chemical industry and they got into German dyes and uh, Las Cellophane from France and uh, Rayon from France. And so there was a lot of exchange then between, there was a lot of exchange between DuPont and these uh, enterprises in Germany and... Yeah, well, yeah. The, the, the Britain, uh, Europe, both Germany and France and England were all in bad shape after the war and they would do anything for money. And they they would sell their know-how to the Americans for a fee, and uh, that's where Dupont got so much of its diversification in uh, in the twenties. And uh, but the, the German, of course, the Germans had this. They had all the uh, synthetic nitrate that they wanted because of what uh, 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 Fritz Haber yeah. hmm? Haber hey, yeah. yeah Fritz Haber had uh, had provided the uh, know-how for the Kaiser building his big powder plants but and William Ramsey had to match it with uh, natural nitrates from Chile. Mm. 